Now we're going to move into the fourth and final conic section called the hyperbola. Uh, we've already seen circles, parabolas, and ellipses, and their definitions all revolve around this idea of a distance, right? A circle is the distance, um, it's, the, it's all points whose distance from a fixed center is the same. Uh, a parabola is all the points whose distance from a fixed point and line are the same. Uh, an ellipse is the collection of all points um, whose, where the sum of the distances to two fixed points is the same, the sum of the distances. Well, here a hyperbola is basically a similar idea to an ellipse, but instead of the sum of their distances, we're looking at the difference of their distances. Okay, so technically I would say that a hyperbola is the collection of all points the difference of whose distances from two fixed points is a constant. Now let me illustrate what that means. It means you have two points, two fixed points we call the foci, right? F1 and F2, we've seen foci before. And we've got points on the hyperbola. There's, now the graph of the hyperbola we'll talk about in a moment, but let's just say P is on the hyperbola. Then you've got two distances. You've got the distance from P to F1, and you have the distance from P to F2, right? So one of them there, one of them there. Now the difference between those distances it has to be constant, okay? So if I subtract those, those have to equal a constant, all right? So for instance, if one distance was four and the other distance was three, the difference between them is one. And so you'd be looking for all the points the difference of whose distances is one. And so you could have a five and a four, or an eight and a seven, or you could have a 10.5 and a 9.5, as long as the, distance, the, the difference between the distances is fixed, whatever that fixed value is, then you have a point on the hyperbola. <clears throat> so there's really two, well, there's really three things that define the hyperbola. The location of the foci and that fixed distance. So if I fix the foci, I say the distance is one, or I say the distance is 10, then that distance along with the given foci will define everything you need for the parabola, or for the, for the hyperbola, okay? Um, and so this equation will hold. Now, what we could do, is, what you'll find is that if you fix that distance, the graph of the hyperbola between any two foci is going to have a shape that kind of goes around the two foci like this, okay? Um, that can be derived, we can explain. I'm not gonna go through all the details because uh, it's given pretty well in the book. Um, in fact, I went through a lot of the details on the derivation of the parabola and ellipse uh, equations. I'm going to skip a lot of those details with the hyperbola just to save time to spare you another uh, half hour video. Uh, instead, um, I'm going to refer to the textbook. The textbook has all these derivations. Hopefully it will make a little bit more sense having seen the ellipse already. Um, in our textbook, the derivation is on page 677, okay, 677. Uh, and so you can find that in the pre-calculus textbook, okay? All right. Um, so anyway, uh, moving on then, what I want to mention is that if we orient the uh, hyperbola in such a way that the foci are on the x-axis and the two portions are opening kind of horizontally, uh, we can derive a formula using these distances. We just have to put coordinates on the foci um, and on the center which of course the center is going to be halfway between the foci. And you have to define some things and put um, coordinates on them, just like we did with the ellipse. One thing I want to mention before I get into the actual formula is a few other definitions. First of all, the center is um, halfway between the foci. Okay, just like it is with the ellipse, no different there. Um, we have two main 
axes that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about something called the uh, transverse axis. Axis, sorry, uh, the transverse axis uh, contains the foci. Okay, and then we have something called the conjugate axis. Conjugate axis contains the center and is perpendicular to the foci. Okay, so it contains the center and is perpendicular to the foci. So if the center is here, so here's F1, here's F2, here's C, the center, then the transverse, I'll call it TA for the transverse axis, and the conjugate axis would then be this one running vertically. In this case, that's a conjugate axis, okay? All right, let's erase my first diagram. Okay, and so, uh, when we derive the formula, we just center this at the origin. We put the foci at two different locations. Um, we're going to call those locations uh, plus and minus little c. All right, big C is the center here. Uh, plus minus little c as a value. Those are going to be the coordinates of your uh, foci. Now the vertices are the points of intersection with the actual hyperbola and the transverse axis, okay? So the verte vertices um, are the intersection of the hyperbola with the transverse axis, I'll call it the TA again, all right? And then the actual hyperbola itself are these two curves. The two curves that make up the parabola are each called branches. Okay. So the two curves that make the hyperbola are called branches. Okay. So that gives us some definitions now to work with. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out the equation for this hyperbola. And maybe I'll sketch another one just off to the side here, a little bit cleaner version of this. The hyperbola, I'll draw the two branches in. And I'll draw my foci. Uh, maybe I'll give myself a little bit more space. And one focus. Coming across, here's the other one. Now there's going to end up being symmetry with this. And the reason is when you take the difference between two numbers, depending upon which one is bigger, you could have a positive value or a negative value. All right, if you take the distance to F1 to be the bigger distance, you'll get a positive value, right? A bigger minus a smaller. Well, that will give you something over on this right side because the distance all the way over there is bigger than the one to this side, to F2. If you want the distance to F2 to be bigger, that'll give you the negative constant, a negative version of the constant, then you want the, um, you want this side on the left. That would give you um, a shorter distance to F1 and a longer distance to F2. So those distances could be positive or negative um, depending upon uh, which of those two values is bigger, okay? Um, all right, and so that's where the two sides to this hyperbola come from. Well, if you'll notice, the, if we wanna figure out where the coordinates of the vertices are um, and how that relates to everything, let's take a quick look and let's just call those um, from the center here, let's say the center is at zero, then let's say the vertices are at A and the foci are at C. So here's negative a, and this would be negative c. Then let's try to figure out how that a value corresponds to our, um, our definition here. 
And so what we have is a bunch of distances. Now, if this point, the vertex, um, satisfies my definition, which it must, then the distance from, and I'm going to call this uh, vertex 1, and this one's vertex 2. I'm going to look at vertex 2 for a moment. Um, if I go from vertex 2 to focus 1, well, that's going to be this total distance here, which incorporates A, then another A, and then, well, actually, it goes A and then C, right? To go from 0 to A and 0 to negative C. That's A plus C, right? Uh, so that gets you to focus 1. To go from vertex 2 to focus 2, right, from this point to this point, you're doing, well, you would take the total different distance and subtract that one off, so it's a, C minus A, right, C minus A. So this A plus C, A plus C, gives me the distance from V2 to F1, and C minus A gives me, I'm sorry, C minus A gives me the distance from V2 to F2, right? Here's distance A, here's distance C, I subtract them to get the remaining amount. Now, if I want to take the difference between those two, I'd have, let's see, A plus C minus C minus A. If I combine, if I distribute the minus and combine those, um, I get A plus C minus C plus A, distribute the minus, the C's drop out and the A's add up, you get 2A. Well, 2A must be the constant, right? It's The difference is equal to the constant. So that means this constant must be the 2A that I'm referring to. And so um, the, the location of the vertex, or in fact, the distance from the center to the vertex is half of this constant, always, okay? So my constant is always equal to either positive or negative 2a. And again, it's positive or negative depending upon which side of the hyperbola we're on, all right? Um, so that gives us some information, at least about the vertices and how that relates to the constant. Now, what I could do is create a more general formula. This was a particular formula for the vertex, and it works. We know that this is true because this is constant, and so it's always going to be 2a no matter what point I choose on the hyperbola. However, the left side here might change, even though the right side will be constant, the left side, the, the, the structure of that might change based upon the point that I choose. And so if I choose another point up here, I'll call it P and give it the coordinates X, Y, then I can construct um, a formula for the hyperbola by using the distance formula from that point over to each of the foci and subtracting them, okay? So the first distance would be the square root. Remember, the distance formula is the difference in the x-coordinates. So that would be x minus negative c, so x plus c squared, plus the difference in the y-coordinates. Well, that's y to 0. So that'd be y minus 0 squared minus, and then I do the same thing for the other focus here. That would be the square root of x minus c squared, right? The difference in the x coordinates and the difference in the y coordinates squared again would have to equal plus or minus 2a. From this equation, similar to the ellipse uh, derivation we did um, in a previous video, basically you solve, you expand all this stuff out, you solve for a root, you square both sides, you have to solve for another root, you square both sides, you do a bunch of algebra tricks. Uh, I'm going to spare you all those details. Um, they are found in your book I mentioned on page um, 677. Um, however, I'll spare you that uh, and let you look at it if you have any questions. Eventually, what you will get is a formula, and the formula will become 
x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1. And now this will look a lot like the ellipse formula, except it has a minus instead of a plus. Now let's talk about where, what the minus means versus the plus in the ellipse formula. And let's talk about where this b value comes in, because so far I haven't talked about b. b doesn't show up. I have a and c, but I don't have b. And so b comes in in the derivation of this formula. Okay, so when you're, if I were to expand this formula down and work it all out, like I said, at some point in the formula, you end up factoring some stuff out and you get a quantity in the derivation that is a c squared minus a squared, which is, you know, which is an expression we can find based upon this information because we know what c and a are. All right, now that expression is what b, is, b squared is equal to. Okay, so we basically replace that expression with b squared and it solves into this. Now, I could just have c squared minus a squared underneath this y value, but who wants that? That's extra stuff, right? So we use this b squared value. So that means that b squared is defined as the difference between c squared and a squared. Now, does this look familiar? It's similar to the ellipse relationship, but it's actually backwards. Um, so it's uh, B, C, A, whereas in the ellipse formula went B, A, C, okay? So this was backwards from the back, all right? If we think about it that way, I don't know. Um, so it's B, C, A. Um, anyway, that's going to help you find uh, the value of B if given the values for A and C, all right? So that relationship is going to hold. Okay, now, where does this minus come in? How is that significant? Well, it turns out that in a hyperbola, you always have one of the two terms negative, either the x term or the y term. With an ellipse, you had both of them being positive, right? And that had to do with this, the fact that it was the sum of the distances. Here, it has to do with the fact that it's the difference of the distances, okay? One of them being negative. Now, what's interesting is that the negative, I'm sorry, the positive variable is the one that the hyperbola opens around. It's kind of the direction of the hyperbola. If you can imagine, in our case here, we have this hyperbola opening in a horizontal way, uh, sort of around the horizontal axis. We'd also say that the transverse axis is horizontal. That's because the x squared was positive. If it's reversed, um, if we had the y squared here minus an x squared term, that would give us a vertical transverse axis, right? It's going to be opening in a vertical way. Um, so the positive term uh, determines the direction of the hyperbola. Um, what's also interesting about the hyperbola is that it is defined by two uh, asymptotes. Okay, these angles, the, the direction that these arrows go in, are going to be asymptotic to two lines. One line running on a diagonal from upper right to lower left, going through the center, and the other one going from upper left to lower right, again, going through the center. This can all be determined from the um, derivation of the formula. And what's interesting is that the slope of that line, the slope of those two lines, um, are going to be the ratio of the B value and the A value. And so to be specific about the uh, equations of those two asymptotes, they're oblique asymptotes too, by the way, um, to be specific about that, uh, if the graph is opening horizontally, if the transverse axis is horizontal, then the relationship, again, according, uh, assuming that the origin is the center, um, we use the slope-intercept form of a line, y equals mx plus b, okay? Um, I need to erase a few pieces here. Let's get rid of this. Um, so the asymptotes, 
We'll do the positive one first. This one, one is going to have a positive slope, one will have a negative slope. And the equations will be y equals, the positive one is um, b over a times x. Again, the y-intercept is zero because it's going through the origin. And the slope is b over a. Now, the slope is always going to be the y over the x. And you can remember that, I remember that, uh, because the slope formula, if you remember way back in, I don't know, chapter 2 or something, we talked about the slope formula uh, what being y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's always the y's over the x's. Same thing here. You take the, the constant that corresponds to the y and divide it by the constant that corresponds to the x. So just an easy way to remember that. Um, this one is going to have the, basically the reciprocal, uh, not, not the reciprocal, the negative of that slope, okay? Um, same steepness, apparent, uh, essentially, with a negative. So it would be here, y equals negative b over a times x, okay? Again, it's the y constant over the x constant, all right? Okay, so those are your two oblique asymptotes. Now, if I were to change this formula up, um, so this is for a horizontal transverse axis. If I were to change this up and use a vertical transverse axis, A, X, I, S, then the formula changes slightly. Uh, the formula becomes y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared equals 1. And um, again, the negative goes to the x because the positive needs to be on the y to make this go vertically. All right. <clears throat> and in this case, the oblique asymptotes change again a little bit, um, it's, but it's still the y over the x. It's always y over x, okay? So in this case, the oblique asymptotes are going to be y equals plus or minus a over b times x, okay? So you're, you're still doing the y um, constant, the constant that corresponds to y, divided by the one that corresponds to x, okay? So just to keep that in mind. Now let's say I change everything up and I shift this thing around so the center is no longer at zero, zero. All right, so let's erase my definitions here so I can build two new formulas. If the center is at HK, then we have again two formulas, one for the horizontal transverse axis, we'll do that first. Well, of course, you're just going to have x minus h squared over a squared minus uh, y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. But the oblique asymptotes, they also shift accordingly. And so there you'd have uh, y minus k equals plus or minus b over a times x minus h. Right, looks a little bit messy, but you can see the shift going on, right? You're just shifting the y value uh, to the k and the h or the x value to the h, right? So you get your vertical and horizontal shifts that way for the oblique asymptote. Similarly, for the vertical transverse axis, um, you would have y minus k squared over a squared minus x minus h squared over b squared equals 1. Just trying to show you some of the relationships so you can keep track of everything. The oblique asymptote here, again, is going to shift accordingly. It's y minus k equals plus or minus a over b times x minus h. All right, so you can do shifts with lines just as easily as you can do shifts with everything else. Um, so this should not be unfamiliar to you. All right. <clears throat>
Um, and then accordingly, with all these things, you can also shift your vertices, your foci, and well, the center is already shifted, all right? Um, one really nice way to plot um, the oblique asymptotes is um, to kind of draw a box. I like to draw a box. And you draw the box using the slope, the B and the A values. Um, what I would do is um, your B value, because that's your Y, um, gives you the vertical direction. So if you go from zero, if you were to go up B units and over A units, you already are over A units, that gets you to the vertex. And then you go up B, you end up with a rectangle. Okay, so A in the horizontal direction actually is 2A because you, you double the width and 2B vertically. Uh, and then just connect the corners of that box, you'll get the, uh, uh, the graph of those um, asymptotes. Okay, so that's kind of a nice way if you draw that box around the center, connect the corners. Um, or draw the diagonals through the box, those give you the asymptotes, and then you'll have your vertex is the intersection there, and then you can kind of draw your curves asymptotic to those two lines.